Well, hello, I'm the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com. Hope you are doing well. We're going to return once again to Socratic Logic by Peter Creep, which is one of my go-to recommendations if you want to learn traditional verbal style logic. Down below, there's a link to Amazon, and you can purchase this textbook if you so desire, and you can follow along. We're going to do some exercises from Chapter 9, which deals with different kinds of arguments. So here we have the three meanings of because, and we'll discuss them in a moment. We have the four causes. We're also going to make a distinction between an explanation versus an argument. They're not the same thing. And then we'll move to the exercises on page 205. Here Peter Kreef writes, identify which of the four causes is used in each of the following explanations or arguments and tell whether it is an explanation or an argument. We'll do some of these. And if you do have this textbook, feel free to do one of the sentences not covered in this video and share your answer below in the comment section. I would appreciate that a lot. That'd be pretty cool. But in any case, let's think about the three meanings of because. So here, Peter Kreep writes about the physical because, the logical because, and the psychological because. So with the physical because, we're dealing with physical relation, we're dealing with cause and effect relationship. Then we have a logical relation where we deal with premises and conclusion, and then the psychological relation deals with motive and act. And related to this, we can think about the fallacy of subjectivism and the genetic fallacy. So Peter Kreef talks about the genetic fallacy in this book. Here, for example, we have someone dismissing someone's argument with just talking about the origin of their belief and saying, hey, you have this psychological tendency, so therefore I can just dismiss you, and they don't even look at the concrete argument. So we have a genetic fallacy. Now, in general, the fallacy of subjectivism really confuses the because of two and the because of three, the logical because and the psychological because. So consider someone trying to give an argument saying, I think this politician is good because he makes me feel good. Well, here, this person is just appealing to their emotions. So this is just a fallacy of subjectivism. There's no argument given why we should think this politician is good outside of someone's um, internal feelings or subjective feelings. There's no objective evidence given. Now, Peter Kreef gives three examples in his textbook. So one, I will die because of cancer. Well, clearly we have a cause and effect relation. So it's the first because. Number two, I will die because all men die, and I'm a man. Here we have a logical because. We have premises and conclusion. And three, I think I will die today because I'm feeling despair. Here we have a psychological because. And we can think about these things in terms of the four causes. So because number two, we have reasons. We have logical reasons. And this deals with formal causality. We'll get into that in a moment. The because of three has beliefs, and that is to say, we have psychological beliefs. We have psychological explanations. But here we have efficient causality involved. Okay, so we have an agent um, involved. And that agent, we're thinking about the efficient causality of that agent. Now, causes can be used or referenced both in arguments and explanations. An argument tries to prove something. An explanation does not. So an argument, we're given evidence for something, we're justifying something, we're giving a proof. An explanation, we're just saying this is what it is and that's it. There's no more depth than that. There's no argument. So now we can get into the famous four causes. And a lot more can be said about the four causes. There are entire books in the philosophy of nature that will justify the four causes such that we should not only think of causality in terms of efficient causality. We should think about the four causes of Aristotle. Moreover, you can go into a lot of depth when thinking about these four causes. So here we're just giving a surface level presentation, but really these causes are much more multifaceted than you might, might think. And it's a really interesting topic to study if you um, look into philosophy. So on the one hand, we can think about extrinsic causes to the effect, and on the other hand, intrinsic causes to the effect. With extrinsic causes, we have efficient causality and final causality. So efficient causality, we're dealing with the agent that makes, moves, or changes the effect. With final causality, 
we're thinking about the end goal or purpose. Now, this doesn't mean something has to be consciously pursuing a goal. We can think about general regularity or general tendencies of something. It could be totally unconscious, but still have a regularity built into it in such a way that it always aims at something in particular. It has some end in that sense. It doesn't imply consciousness. Then we have intrinsic causes. We have formal and material. So formal deals with the essential nature of what something is. Where material, we're dealing with the contents or what something is made of. Now with that in mind, let's jump into some of the exercises. So this is from page 205 of Peter Kreef's textbook. We're to identify which of the four causes, and we want to know is it an argument or explanation. So number one, I'm getting a college degree to get a better job. I'm getting a college degree to get a better job. So the person's doing that for this particular reason, this goal or end. So definitely we're dealing with final causality. And then the question is, is it an argument or an explanation? It seems to be just an explanation as a matter of fact statement. There's no further justification. So it's definitely an explanation, not an argument. And we're dealing with final causality. So we have a final cause explanation. How about number two? It's loud because it's a rock concert. Now, oftentimes when we see the word because, we should think argument. Now, it's not always the case that just because we see the word because, it's an argument. But generally speaking, we should think maybe it is an argument. Um, now, sometimes there are different ways to interpret these sentences. So is this an argument? Is this an explanation? Now, in my mind, it's better thought of as an explanation, not an argument. But that because we can understand why someone might be trying to construct an argument to say, well, it is the nature of a rock concert to be loud. Okay, so it's loud because it's a rock concert. But in that sense, we should think about the causality involved as formal because we're thinking about the nature of a rock concert versus an efficient cause, okay? But you can understand why someone would say efficient causality because, hey, doesn't the rock concert efficiently cause um, that loud noise or that loud music? So it seems to be an explanation, but we could say it's an argument. We could understand why someone might interpret it as an argument, or we could understand why someone saying this could be thinking that they're making an argument. Now, it's a formal cause insofar as a rock concert's nature is thought of. They were thinking about the nature of the rock concert to be loud. How about number four? He's throwing the textbook at the wall in frustration because he's studying logic. He's throwing the textbook at the wall in frustration because he's studying logic. Now, once again, sometimes this is a little bit open to interpretation, but, but notice he's throwing, he's throwing because of this. He's throwing. So it seems that we're dealing with efficient causality because we're talking about he's throwing this because of this particular reason, right? And it doesn't seem to be an argument. It's just an explanation. So he's studying logic and he's frustrated. So it seems that the best interpretation is definitely to say we're dealing with efficient causality and an explanation, not an argument. How about number five? Toilet paper is absorbent because of its cap capillary structure. Toilet paper is absorbent because of its capillary structure. So we have this because. So you might think, well, is, an argu is it an argument? But it doesn't go into really great depth. So I think it's an explanation. Moreover, we're dealing with the structure of the toilet paper, right? We're thinking about its material contents in that sense. So it's definitely uh, dealing with material causality. Okay, how about number six? The footprint must be that of a six-toed sloth because that's the only animal with six toes. Okay, so which of the four causes is involved? The footprint must be that of a six-toed sloth because it's the only animal with six toes. Well, on the one hand, we might think it, it, 
in terms of material causality because we're dealing with like the the material structure of this sloth. But on the other hand, I can understand why someone would say formal cause or formal causality because um, we're dealing with the nature of a six-toed sloth. Okay, so I think there's a little bit of wiggle room there in that sense in terms of what's the best interpretation. But because we're saying six-toed sloth and we're thinking about its, its configuration, so to speak, maybe material cause is best, not formal cause. Now, be, this because here suggests it might be an argument, and it is an argument because it says that's the only animal with six toes, so we're given like this kind of justification. We're given an um, argumentative justification there, so we're narrowing it down, the only animal with six toes. So that's an argument, not just an explanation. We're given a reason. So we can think of this as a material cause involved because we're doing the shape or structure, so to speak. It is an argument. But we might think of it as a formal cause insofar as the nature of something with six toes is being considered. But I think it's best to think of it as a material cause because we're thinking about the shape or structure of a sloth, a six-toed sloth. And it's definitely an argument. So, of course, there are more of these in the textbook by Peter Kreep. Now, if you enjoy this type of content, um, please consider giving this video a like. I would appreciate it a lot. Um, you can purchase this textbook if you so desire at Amazon through my affiliate link. That would help me out a little, little bit at least. I, I would like that. And if you do want to learn more traditional verbal style logic, take a look at my website, amateurlogician.com. Click on the Trivium Logic section where I have an extensive tutorial there and um, there you will find over 40 entries covering all sorts of different topics. But in any case, thanks so much for watching. Be well and good luck to you.